All right, YouTube has decided we have enough video. Okay, great. I don't know what that's about. Um, let me hit start recording. Excellent. All right, guys. Well, I see you showed up after all. That's a shame. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll talk for the, the lecture today. Um, but it's nice to see everybody here. Uh, this is my last lecture until fall of 2022 because I'm on sabbatical next semester. So I'm very glad about that. Not that I don't love you all, but it's very time consuming. Um, Right, so uh, let's see. So this is our last uh, technical lecture, and then we have a few other things going on in this class that hopefully you are all cognizant of. So on Tuesday, we're going to have a bunch of invited researchers come and tell you about their, their research. So far, we have two, both of whom are my graduate students, but I will be walking around the hallway this afternoon. Oh, actually, one of them is my graduate student, and one is, is your TA, Zoe, um, who does super cool stuff and publishes a lot in graphics. So you, uh, that's, that, that makes sense. Um, and I will walk around the hallways and stata and strong arm people into uh, joining us on Tuesday until we have a full program, so not to worry. Um, I ask that you guys essentially you know, try to make the effort of showing up at that. You aren't responsible for that content, and I know in a lot of your brains that means, okay, then I'm not going to go. But like the whole point of these classes is to learn and, and to get caught up with the state of the art, and, and this is literally the cutting edge. You are in like one of the world centers for doing this stuff, so you might as well see what people are up to. Hopefully I've guilted you enough. Uh, so that's that. And then your final projects are due Thursday slash Friday. Um, so in case you have not checked your email or Piazza recently, uh, we posted instructions on the final presentations. So let me tell you the story now so that I can indemnify myself and you all know that it has been announced. Um, essentially, the way this is going to work, uh, you have the option of either presenting in a pre-recorded format or coming here and presenting you know, in like old school PowerPoint format. Um, either one is fine. Neither one will give you more or fewer points. I couldn't care less. You do you. Uh, the, but the details are, uh, we shared a spreadsheet on Piazza. And essentially, you need to put, you and your group partner need to sign up for one slot on that spreadsheet, regardless of whether you're doing it live or recorded. So what you need to do is just put your name. Um, if it's live, you put it on a particular time. If it's recorded, you just put it in that little part of the, the spreadsheet. Um, we're going to double check that and make sure everybody signed up in the next day or two. That doesn't mean your project needs to be done in the next day or two. It just means put your name somewhere. Um, then, before your presentation, um, you'll have to do one of two things. If you are presenting remotely or whatever, pre-recording, then you'll put like a link to your video. It could be like in a Dropbox or whatever on that spreadsheet. And if you're presenting live, then you'll put a link to a Google slide thing. And what we'll do is we'll just drive it from one laptop in the front of the room. Every single year, somebody puts a link to their Google presentation thing, but then it doesn't make the permissions correct. And then we can't open it, and that causes the whole thing to snowball, and then everybody's late and pissed off. So don't be that guy. Uh, so double check. Open your browser in incognito mode, and make sure your, your link in your presentation works. Moreover, if you embed videos in your presentation, make sure that those are visible from the presentation and have the proper permission. Both of these are things that happen every single year. Uh, other than that, um, if you're looking for the standards or the content, take another look at the instructions that were posted on day one, uh, which lay out pretty clearly exactly what's supposed to go in your project write-up and your presentation. Um, it's not too complicated. Please don't make your, don't go long. <laughs> um, this is a thing. Uh, every single year I get an email asking me, like, is it okay? And, you know, I know that you've asked for however many pages. Is it okay if I do like four more? And my answer is no. That is equally annoying to your professors to going under the thing and not filling in your thing. You know, with every page, that's like some big chunk of our time that we're spending reading it. So it's actually not very considerate of our time as much as I know you're enthusiastic to share every detail of what you did. I love you all, and I'm so excited to see all the cool things that you did but maybe not that excited to read like every line of code that you wrote copy-pasted into a LaTeX file, personally. Um, so, so that's the, the, the basic scenario. Um, I, you know, we all continue to have office hours. You can come hang out, and we're happy to kind of help you. Depending on your project, you might get like sympathy, like, yeah, that's hard. <laughs> um, or we might be able to actually help. You know, the, the thing about these projects, they're open-ended, so they depend a bit on the topic. But this is my sixth year teaching this course, so I think I've seen about 98% of the, the, what, what's come my way so far. Any questions about that, logistics, project stuff, or otherwise? Cool. All right. Well, um, oh, and your, your last nano quiz, I think, is posted or will be posted shortly. Uh, and then you're done with those. Cool. So essentially, our goal will be to get your grades out shortly after you turn in all of your projects. 
it's not too hard to grade this kind of stuff. Uh, and then we're all done, and you never have to look at me again. All right, so uh, with that, let's get started with our last uh, discussion for, for 6837 here. And we really are kind of wrapping up our story in a funny way, right? I mean, we started with basically an abstract description of a scene that you might want to draw on your computer screen, uh, you know, and then an abstract way to capture animation and so on. Then we talked about rendering, like actually putting it in a pixel grid, which in some sense converts from one digital representation into another, right? Like the bits describing your geometry and scene and material into like a grid of pixel colors. Of course, the last little bit of uh, this whole process is the actual display technology or, or the output device. And so to just kind of wrap up our story, that's what we'll talk about today. Now, of course, the reality is that display devices change all the time. Moreover, many of them are proprietary. We don't know every single thing that goes on inside of them. I guess if you were bored, you could take a sledgehammer or a pair of scissors and, and try to figure out for yourself, although these days that's awfully small. Um, but, you know, we, we do have some idea of the sort of basic technologies that people use for displays, and we'll give you some idea of what those look like today. So that's, that's our, our basic goal. So today, uh, we'll have a bit of a shorter discussion. We'll tell you a bit about 2D displays. The reality is that despite what Minority Report might have you think, those are the dominant display technology today in 2021. Um, but we'll also talk about some of the interesting technology for making 3D uh, displays as well. Interestingly, many of these are I don't think they're failed experiments, but they're just things that didn't catch on, right? Like, like every couple of years, people come up with interesting 3D displays, some of which, you know, you can view from the outside, some of which you have to wear headphones, or headphones, um, goggles, you know, whatever. Uh, and somehow, these are not terribly popular. Um, you could ask why, and I, you know, I can guess, but, you know, the reality is the dynamics of these markets are, are really tricky and, and hard to, to, to guess. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a tiny bit of discussion of some of like what goes into VR and, and why that's both an exciting and really difficult space to work in. Um, right, so let's uh, get started and talk about uh, 2D display. So if you recall all the way back from like lecture one or two here, essentially most of this class uh, is kind of operating somewhere between like the second and the third part of the, the computer graphics stack. Right, so there's this whole set of abstractions that happen in a typical piece of computer graphics software that we maybe don't have to navigate all that often. And that, that sort of depends on what job you have, right? Like if you're working at a game studio, chances are you're pretty far up in the abstraction kind of pile of tools here, right? If you're using something like Unity or whatever your favorite in-house game development tool is, you might not even be writing like OpenGL shaders, but rather they're these sort of high-level controls that you know, can plug into C++ or Python or whatever your favorite programming language. And with, with some high level direction and even user interfaces and art, artistic kind of tools, you can, can start to create, you know, 3D environments, 2D and so on, right? And so somehow sitting up on the, the, the sort of application layer are these libraries that handle a lot of what we would call computer graphics classes from this, the perspective of 6837 completely transparently. I mean, you can get pretty far making pretty cool looking 3D graphics with no knowledge of, of what we've done in this course, for better or for worse. But the reality is that when you make an application like this, there's this whole layer of abstractions that are going on, which are essentially different software tools that are each relying on each other in this sort of Rube Goldberg fashion that, that all get mixed together to make that, that, that content on your screen. Right? So sitting underneath that application layer, of course, is some sort of graphics uh, software like OpenGL or DirectX, which is sort of maintaining that relationship between you and the graphics card. Um, but it's also relatively high level. I mean, it's not like you need to know precisely how your graphics card is dealing with multi-threading to write a shader, right? Like that's that's being handled for you. Although every once in a while, it's not. I mean, you you, you know, when you guys wrote shaders for your fifth assignment, I think you discovered some error messages that were really puzzling and a bit different from what you're used to in, in other coding. Um, and frustratingly, of course. Well, I would argue you're 100% used to runtime errors because all of you guys write Python code, and that's all the only error there is. But um, in any event, the uh, uh, right, the what was I saying? Um, right. So, so tools like like OpenGL, DirectX, are maintaining that nice relationship for you, and and for the most part, this is a really good thing, right? Because like now, you know, Nvidia comes out with a new card, or like you're using, you know, my my old man laptop with my my old man phone case. And it, uh, you know, it doesn't even have a graphics card in it, right? This has that like Intel integrated graphics thing. 
the reality is that like the way the silicon and the circuits work in this kind of integrated graphics card is quite different from like the fancy GPU in your, your, your MacBook, which is quite different from like whatever's in your Xbox. But yet like the same piece of OpenGL code often, but not always works <laughs> and all these different devices. Um, but the, you, you start to see some cracks in the facade, right? Like for example, if you took your broken assignment five code and ran it on someone else's laptop, you might have noticed that the errors w would be different or maybe they wouldn't even fail at all, right? Because different graphics cards are giving you back different complaints about what you've done wrong. So you can start to see some of the hardware there. But of course, sitting underneath all of that is really where, where the hardware stuff starts, right? I mean, at some point you have to actually interface with like the cables that are plugged into the, the, the end of your machine. And of course, there's sort of a few different things that matter. You know, your graphics card is the thing that's going to actually output the signal to your screen. And that's sort of maintaining this relationship between, you know, the signal going to your monitor and also the signal that's coming from your processor, your main memory, all that good stuff. So today we're going to sit somewhere uh, on the bottom part, but mostly thinking about just what happens with those last bits and bytes that are coming out of your graphics card and into your monitor. Obviously, there's one big missing piece here, and conveniently this, this semester has one fewer lecture than uh, in, in past offerings of, 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 of 6837, which is how the GPU itself actually works. I've sort of given up trying to teach that in this course because every time I do, it goes out of date within like 10 seconds. Um, so I think the abstractions we've covered here are actually kind of reasonable. Um, and I encourage you to go check out the latest like NVIDIA advertisements to see what people do. It, it changes all the time. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about a few different uh, 2D display technologies. Of course, you're all looking at one, either the screen if you're paying attention or your laptop if you're not. Uh, and um, essentially each one of these things you know, has a, a, a very different way of producing an image in front of your face. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the beautiful thing and the abstraction that we all interact with quite a bit, but we don't think about it all, is the fact that, like, we can plug the same HDML, HD, ah, HDMI cable into any of these devices and produce an image, and they're completely agnostic to precisely the, the, the technology that, that, that's doing that, right? This didn't used to be the case, right? I mean, if you wanted to, like, make an old Atari video game. You needed to know precisely, you know, like the scan line pattern of your, your, your TV or what have you, maybe to, to produce that thing. And then whenever you switch your display technology, you had to switch out your video game as well. Um, thankfully, that's no longer the case. And we've all accepted on this nice standard that allows us to, to swap things out. With the exception of some Apple products, but that's a, a discussion for another day. Um, so the displays that I think are the easiest to understand, unfortunately, are probably somewhat out of date for our discussion in 837. I mean, I, have, do you guys even interact with, with cathode ray tube uh, displays anymore? You remember these, these computer monitors with the big space behind them? You know, if you watch like TV shows about the 90s, computer screens didn't used to be flat like this. They had, you know, like a, a thing in the back. Yeah. Maria's like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, right, so essentially, um, the early displays took up a lot of space and, and that's because uh, the way that they were doing it, <laughs> which is like super cool and in some sense way more exciting than, than what goes on in your, 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 CR, your, your LCD screen, um, is that they're using an electron gun. And so, so really what's going on here is uh, when you have a display, really the com these old computer screens, you can see here, here's like the computer screen and then here's the electron gun and they basically just removed the like plastic that usually is, is sitting around it. Um, what goes on is that you're like producing the image, or at least the light source, in the very back of the TV, and then it's getting kind of magnified by virtue of just going through that big empty space, and then it hits the screen in the front, um, and essentially can excite different phosphors that are, are, are emitting R, G, and B, and that's what you see in front of the screen. And so essentially, all that's going on with the CRT display is that there's this electron gun, but if you think about it, the phrase electron gun it's kind of a weird thing for a two-dimensional display, right? Like this is a thing that's shooting out like a thing on a line. And so this starts to explain some of the terminology we've already seen in this course, right? So you have this raster, which is this like grid of pixels that are sitting on the display in front of you. And then the gun is like whizzing back and forth at really quick rates along this thing, exciting these different phosphors or not. And that's what's creating the display uh, in front of you, right? That's also what created that like 1970s aesthetic where you'd see like a laser going back and forth in front of a video game, go faster and faster until a display would kind of appear. I'm making a bunch of references that none of you understand. Um, so this is uh, an example of a phenomenon called phosphorescence, right? Where essentially what you're doing is you're, you know, putting energy into uh, some type of material, right? In this case, this, this phosphor, and then it lights up. And the basic uh, trick here is, of course, 
it releases the energy slowly as light. Right? And so the idea is that you want the light to disperse out of that phosphor more slowly than the amount of time it takes for the, the electron gun to get back to that, that pixel, or else your screen's just going to go dark. Right? Um, there are a couple interesting kind of corollaries to the way this technology works. Um, and and it, it leads to some really fun experiments that you should not try at home. Um, so let me see. So I tested this this morning and it worked, but I think the internet, is the internet in this room not very reliable? Oh no. <laughs> That's too bad. I tested that this morning. Okay, well, I can, here, I will draw for you the YouTube video I was going to share. Um, ah, came from our physics department, for heaven's sake. Right, so, so in this experiment, we have a, a, a cathode ray uh, display. Um, so here, I don't know why they felt like they had to set this particular experiment up, but there's like a clock in a room. They're like videotaping the clock and then taking the video and just sending it back out on the TV. They could have also just played back a display, but, the, but whatever. Um, I see your hand. Uh, and essentially what they, they do is they have this magnet and they're going to hold the magnet up to the display. And what do we know about electrons? Yeah, they have um, charge. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and uh, in particular, we know that charge and magnets interact, right? So if I hold a giant magnet in front of my monitor, those electrons, which are flying in from this, this, this gun in the back of the, uh, the, the, the display, get redirected, right? So what does that mean? Like, what's that going to do to the uh, display or the image that I see on my screen? Yeah, Maria. That's right, because remember that, like, essentially the raster, like, the, the phosphors on your screen are just these fixed materials that are sitting in front of you, like, waiting for energy to come in. And so what you're doing with this magnet is just redirecting the energy somewhere else, and then it hits the wrong, the wrong phosphor, right? And so this is this fun thing that we could all do in the 1990s with our parents' TVs and then get in trouble if you got too close to the computer, um, which is as follows, dot, 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 maybe. Aha! From the Physics Technical Services Group, which apparently is a group that we have. Yeah, this is a high-quality graphics here. Yeah, and, yeah, that's right. It's computer vision. <laughs> they actually managed to find a clock that does not look like a real clock. There you go. Okay, so you can see what's going on here. And it's not like it's like somehow moving the actual pixels around. It's just redirecting those electrons. As they get this game. So that's like a good uh, experiment to do if you happen to have an old uh, CRT display at your disposal. Um, any guess as to what happens if you do that with your laptop display? You no longer have a laptop. Um, so do not try this experiment at home unless you are a thousand percent confident that this is uh, the technology that you're, you're playing with. Yes? Why does it, why does, I remember elementary school, like my, my teacher said the same thing, why is it like particularly damaging for LCD? Um, it's probably not damaging for the LCD display specifically, but your LCD is close to a lot of other stuff in your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> and in general, magnets don't play well with computational uh, equipment, so I just would not, not suggest it. If you want to and you've got an old computer, then you, go, you do you, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm on camera here. I, I, you didn't get it from me. Um, yeah, that's uh, the last laptop I really destroyed. I was making a key lime pie, and I, knocked, I, I squeezed literally a gallon of lime juice and just poured it on the laptop, and there's, there's no recovering from that. Um, it's like acidic, too, right? Like, yeah, that was... At the time, I was a grad student, so I picked up the laptop, I poured it back into the pie, and <laughs> I mean, like, why destroy a laptop and a good pie, I, you know? Um, but I digress. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, uh, CRT displays um, were some of the earliest ones. They're pretty easy to control. Um, there's a problem, which is they take up a bunch of space. Uh, so of course, since then, uh, we've moved away as a society from that display technology, mostly to many other uh, ones, which are, are ones that are more familiar to you. Uh, so one of the more typical ones in your laptop monitor, for example, is something called an LCD display, which is essentially taking advantage of light polarization, right? So um, in these sorts of displays, what happens is that you have a source of polarized light right behind your display, and you've got this particular material here that can do one of two things. It can either take the polarized light and just leave it alone, let it pass through with the same polarization, or it can twist it like 90 degrees, right? So you've got a wave that's going up and down, and you pass through this uh, twisted pneumatic uh, uh, material here, 
And what it does is it kind of like takes this thing and redirects the energy to just kind of reorient. And then what you do is you have in the front of your LCD a second filter, which is like just polarizing sunglasses. Right? And so what happens is when this material is activated, right, you've got this material that can like twist in and out of shape. When it twists into shape, then suddenly you know, the light bends and it's aligned with the polarizer and you see something and otherwise it gets blocked. Notice that there's a commonality between a lot of these displays, which is that the light energy is there whether you see it or not. Like you're, I think one of these things that is not 100% clear for some display technologies is like some displays, not all, all of them, is that like if you dim your screen, like if you're actually using less power or not, I think depends a lot on the details of how these things are engineered. Um, but in any event, that's, that's essentially what's going on here. And we've got like a nice little video animation, basically just repeating what I already said, but there, there's, it's kind of nice to see um, in an extremely enthusiastic TV voice, uh, see this thing explained in a little more detail. I'm sorry this is taking so long to load today. I don't know what that's about. On the other hand, I mean, we are like streaming this course onto the internet, downloading things from YouTube and putting it on a screen at once. And like, I, I don't know if you noticed, but we're like living in the future. This is if you were to zoom in on the monitor you were using to watch this video, um, you would see thousands of small red, green, and blue dots. Three of these grouped together make up one picture element, or pixel for short. When you split up each pixel, you will see a backlight, three color filters, and polarizers. As light leaves the backlight, it travels along different planes, including the horizontal and vertical planes. The first polarizer only allows light traveling along the horizontal plane to pass through it, and on to the color filters. With another polarizer that only allows light to pass along the vertical axis, all the horizontal light waves are blocked, so no light reaches the color filters. This is where the liquid crystals come into play. If you were to look closely at one of these liquid crystals, you would see a transparent electrode on the front and the back, as well as etched glass on the front and the back. Liquid crystals typically orient themselves in random directions until the horizontally etched glass in the rear and the vertically etched glass in the front force them to twist into a predictable pattern. As light passes through the compressed liquid crystal, it naturally follows the path of the molecules so that any light traveling along the horizontal plane exits along the vertical plane. By reintroducing the electrodes and passing electricity through them, we can get the molecules to align themselves in the direction of the electric flow, causing light to no longer twist when passing through the liquid crystal. When we place these crystals back into the pixel, Okay, at that point, it's just justifying you can put these things in a giant grid. But like, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the basic technology uh, there. Of course, there are a lot of questions that you should have about like, well, what does this twist picture even mean? And why does this turn the light? I'm the wrong guy to answer these questions. But, but that's the, the, the right uh, the sort of schematic to have in mind. Of course, LC, LCD displays are, are part of your everyday life, even if you don't have a laptop. I mean, I think the earlier LCDs were like these transmissive, uh, uh, or rather uh, reflective LCDs, where essentially it's exactly the same technology, but the light source is sort of in front of the display instead of the back. And so like some of the old clocks or wristwatches and so on had this, this sort of structure, right? Essentially the idea is you polarize the light going in and then you polarize either identically or differently coming out, and, and that's how you're, you're creating a display. And um, of course, when you're doing that, um, in both of these uh, display technologies we talked about so far, color is not a particularly interesting part of the technology, right? Like essentially what, what these are really doing is producing black and white images, and then there's just one additional layer sitting on top, which is uh, creating red, green, and blue. And so, of course, this means that, that you have to be really careful when you are figuring out what signal to send to your display, because really these three, there are these sort of three pixel grids, right, R, G, and B, which are displaced from one another. They're, they're not exactly in the same spatial location, right? And just as a tiny bit of review from this course, do you guys remember when this like really makes a big difference, like where this, you really see these problems in your display if you've done it wrong? edges, and in particular, where, where, where are there like little tiny sharp edges? You're looking at your screen, it's the right thing to do. Fonts, that's right. So, so remember we talked, for example, about this idea of clear type fonts, where the idea was that you do your anti-aliasing at the sub-pixel level, like this image on the right-hand side. And the reason is, is exactly what you saw on these displays, right? You have this fixed pattern of RGB, RGB, RGB on your screen, and so you can actually get sort of three times denser anti-aliasing if you're aware of that pattern 
and sort of modify brightness based on precisely where you are on the screen. It's a really clever idea and actually makes a big difference when, when you do font display. Um, continuing to reminisce about the 90s, if you, uh, you know, have one of these old machines before they, they came up with clear type or like when there was an agreement on the right pattern of RGB, in which case you couldn't do clear type. Um, it really actually was harder to read like text in, in Microsoft Word. Like <laughs> it, it makes a big difference just for, for little stuff. Okay, so um, that's the, the dominant display technology today because of course, you, you know, that you're all, I can't get you to look up away from them during this class. So uh, and as, instead, of course, especially at larger scale, there, there are other technologies that are out there that are worth knowing. Um, one of the other ones, the one that I think I'm the most comfortable explaining as a mathematical person is the LED display, where literally you just have a giant pile of light bulbs and, and you turn them on and off. Um, this, one, this one speaks to me, I get this one. Um, where, it, you know, and of course, so if you're like at a football stadium, you can do that. The problem is that LEDs take up a lot of space, so, so engineering this on a small scale is, is much more difficult. Although I've noticed in shopping malls, sometimes they have these kinds of displays. Um, they tend to be really, really bright, right, because you're literally placing a light source precisely where you need it. On the other hand, as I've learned in these shopping malls, if you walk into them, for some reason they produce a lot of static electricity, which is really awkward. Um, Another uh, display which is particularly popular in TVs is uh, plasma. Um, it's kind of cool, right? Like essentially every area of like science, materials, chemistry you can think of, like somebody's probably used it to engineer a display. I mean, I think that's sort of what you can see going on here, right? Like, like somebody looked at these, these twisted pneumatic materials and came up with LCD. Somebody else, you know, who knows something about gas, um, you know, thought about what they were doing and, and managed to engineer a, uh, a plasma uh, display channel where, where essentially what's going on here is you have these little patterns of, of cells that are filled with some, some gas, like neon or xeon. And now, uh, rather than you know, taking light from behind your screen and just kind of redirecting it like an LCD, um, in this case, you're actually producing it by like placing a little lamp by exciting that, that gas. Right? So here, um, you're sort of making this uh, transition from you know, electrical signal directly to like exciting um, a particular material. And that's what's creating your display. So to continue in our um, you know, low voice narrators explaining to you the details of your TV display. You know, the good thing is this is an entire like category on YouTube and these people have worked really hard to come up with cute scientific visualizations of what's going on. So I see no reason to try and mumble my way through it. Um, if it decides to load, <laughs> we can see inside of your, your plasma TV. I believe this guy, unlike our last kind of monotone, like. I would say mildly Texas variety. This is more of a uh, TV. The answer is, is uh, the plasma. plasma. Each subpixel is yeah. filled with a mixture of gas, xenon, and neon. When an electrical okay. impulse of about 300 volts rushes through a subpixel on uh, its way to the electrodes, right. electrons from the gas mixture are violently tapping, right? torn off and suddenly float freely. That drastically changes the state of the mixture. It's no longer gas. It's now plasma. It's a highly energized state of matter. But it's a state that lasts only as long as the electrical discharge. As soon as the discharge ends, the freed electrons immediately return to their places, and the plasma once again becomes gas. What's important is that as they return to their places, the electrons release their surplus energy in the form of ultraviolet rays. It's these rays that excite the subpixel, which gives off light that combines with the light given off by the two other subpixels, and together they light up the pixel. Every it's these rays that excite the subpixel, which gives off light that combines with the light given off by the two other subpixels, and together they light up the pixel. Okay. I've, I've noticed that every single one of these videos follows exactly the same pattern. There's like about 18 seconds of useful content, and then they, you know, explain like for like 20 minutes of pixel grid. Um, right. So there's the, the plasma display, and this is really just the, the tip of the iceberg. So like in the slides, I've included a little bit of material about organic LEDs. Um, these seem to come in and out of popularity depending on the day. These can be uh, flexible and so on. They sort of, in principle, have kind of a similar scenario, like some material that gets excited and released light. Um, but I'm, I'm told that, that they can be a bit tricky to, to engineer and that they, they die pretty fast. So in any event, those are all the kind of displays that can like sit right in front of your face. But of course, that's only the beginning of display technology. I mean, we're surrounded by different things that are producing 
visual signal, and sometimes we don't even think about it. Um, the one that many, if not all of you, are looking at right now is the, uh, the projector screen. And of course, this is quite different from uh, many of the displays, because this thing is just a piece of material, right? There's no, uh, no silicon anywhere to be seen nearby. Um, so uh, uh, projectors, in particular this DLP technology, to me, like on the one hand, there's like, you know, LED displays, which are just like big piles of light bulbs, and they like just make perfect sense. And it's like, well, of course, that's a good display. Like if you put me in a room with a bunch of electronic gadgets and ask me to make a display, that's what I would do. On the other hand, there's the DLP, which is just like this magical Rube Goldberg machine that to me is just incredible that this device works at all. Um, has any of you guys ever like cut open one, a projector like, like one of these guys and actually look? It's just, just amazing like, what these things do. Like as, as a, again, you, you might have figured out by now, your instructor is a theorist. I'm definitely, my personal research is in like the first half of this course, not the second. But um, when I look at this stuff and you start to read through the descriptions of just like precisely how they engineer what goes on inside of your typical projector, I mean, like, it might as well just be like a mouse running around on like a track and like, you know, pulling things in and, and flipping them every which way. So essentially, right, what goes on in a lot of these uh, DLP uh, projector displays, so here's like an image of, of one. Um, there's like a surprising number of moving parts. So you have a, the, the basic engineering issue that goes on with a display like this is it needs to be really bright, right? Because you have this tiny little point source of light, it's far, far away, and you're trying to like compete with the lights in my classroom. And you can actually see a pretty reasonable thing in front of you. Of course, if you go to the movie theater, that's even more extreme, right? I mean, you've got this huge display that's being produced in a very small amount of space. And so from that sort of engineering perspective, the priorities kind of change. Like, no longer do you want like a big grid of pixels, like little, little plasma things necessarily, but rather maybe you just want like a giant flashlight and you're just trying to take the energy from that thing and redirect it into a pattern that makes sense. But it's a very different way of thinking about making a display. So like I've got this giant light source, which is just fixed, and I'm trying to reshape that into what you're looking at in front of you. And so the way that this technology works extremely roughly, which is just, it's just amazing. You know, I, sorry, I just, I just think this is so cool. Um, so you have this, this light source on one side, which is literally just a light bulb. If you've ever had to replace a light bulb in your projector, you know that they're weirdly expensive. They're super bright. You have your display in front, uh, and then you have this light absorber. And so what goes on? is the, the chip inside of your, your display has little itty bitty mirrors. And what they're doing is they receive the signal from, you know, in this case, what my HDMI table, which cable, which is plugged into the floor, goes digitally through our ceiling into the projector here. Um, and essentially, depending on whether or not a pixel should be lit up or not, the mirror either points outward, like toward the lens of the, the display, or it just points at this like piece of black material on the side of the projector. Right, so like think about like, you know, I, I like hold up a mirror in front of you, you hold a flashlight, you know, and like, you know, I, I, I want to wake up your student who's asleep right now, so I point my mirror at them and I redirect the light in their face, you know, then I can do that and, and suddenly they get a bunch of light and then if I point it toward the wall, the light energy goes away, right? So I could do that and be my obnoxious self or I could do that at a rate of 60 times a second on a little tiny grid sitting on top of a chip and that is what's going on inside of your, 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 your DLP display. <laughs> And it's, this is just incredible to me. There's like this mechanical device that's like flipping back and forth and in such a precise way that it can do that and create an image. Um, and, and one that like you don't even notice that like, you know, as I, I flip these slides here, so some pixels go from dark to light, like it's not like you see, you know, this mirror, like I'm like imagining like a little elf sitting inside of your DLP, like cranking it the other direction. It's not, you, you don't see any of that, right? This all happens really, really quickly. It's just, just incredible. In case that wasn't complicated enough, any idea how many of these things get color displays? I mean, this is like, you know, this is a black and white kind of thing. I can either turn a, a pixel on or off. <laughs> Think if you were like engineering a really complicated Rube Goldberg device, how would you get color? Three light bulbs, Three light bulbs would be too simple. <laughs> no, so here's, here's a picture actually. So oftentimes what they'll do is there'll actually be a wheel spinning around <laughs> and, and you know, with red, green, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. And depending on which filter is sitting in front of this thing, it produces one color or the other. And this is synchronized with these little flipping mirrors, all at this extremely fast rate to produce this image that, that you have. To me, this is just the most incredible, cool technology. I don't know, like, 
I'm sure that like if you're you know a materials engineer and you actually make these chips, it like makes perfect sense that this should be a reasonable thing to do. But as a person who's never touched one of these things, whenever I look at these schematics, I think this is just just wild. Like, <laughs> and they can do all these things in, in sync. Right. So um, if this is on these sort of like lots of moving parts, everything is going crazy, and there's a stupid amount of energy going on uh, side of the spectrum. Probably on the opposite side of the spectrum would be like your Amazon Kindle, you know, like your ebook. Um, and those are, are really interesting displays as well. And um, the way that those work is quite, it's, it's really interesting. Like, for, so for one, it, have you ever seen an animation on a Kindle? Yeah, is it an animation? Like, is it intentional or is it that just that you're perceiving change? <laughs> like, do you see a character walking across the screen? Probably not. Because the display rate in one of those things is ridiculously slow, right? Like when you have um, one of these ebooks and you turn the page, like you can see the page going away and the next one coming up. And the reason for that is that these things are almost closer to trying to simulate ink um, than anything else. And so, uh, interestingly, from an energetic perspective, what goes on in these displays is that the energy is spent changing from one image to the next. It is not spent just displaying something every single second. Right? Like most of the displays we've talked about so far. You know, like you, if you if you stop sending signal to your projector, it's not like you just see the last image and it just stays there. It just like it just turns off, right? The, whereas your ebook, like you can sit on the same page indefinitely and it doesn't like use up a bunch of battery. And the reason is that there's some kind of e-ink, like some magnetically charged little microcapsule. And what happens when you turn the page is that it applies a voltage which pulls the dark stuff up or to the bottom. And when you do that, now all of the um, essentially all you're doing is it's just acting like a page of a book, right? Like it's not like there's necessarily a backlight behind this display. The light is coming down onto your book and just bouncing off just like ink. Yeah? Uh, so related to this, I think, you mm -hmm. you're like writing with like an Apple Yeah. I kind of doubt it because I think the Apple pencils typically are on like an LCD or an organic display, right? Um, yeah, no, I don't know precisely what goes on with those. I think these are, are materials where it's really designed, you know, it's like an Etch-a-Sketch <laughs> is, is really what's going on inside of here. Um, it's a good question. I, I actually don't know exactly what, what goes on with the, the pen displays. I think some of them are not too smart. Like if I recall, the Apple Pencil is not pressure sensitive, right? No, it's calibrated. It is? Extremely calibrated. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Right, like they're, they're, that's right. Like you have to put a battery in the pen, right? Like the the Cintiq ones to me are always nicer. Um, but the uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's a good question. I, I should read up on it. I, I don't know. Um, the other thing you don't see a ton of are uh, e-ink displays that are in color. I mean, if you think about our strategies for displaying color so far, they don't translate terribly well to this uh, setting. So there are a few e-ink uh, displays where they just kind of put RGB and filters on top. I mean, you, you've probably seen these on occasion. And they're, they're kind of lame, right? Like, essentially, it's, it's very hard to take whatever lights in your environment reflected off of, of a, a material like this and, and get meaningful color. And moreover, you get one third the, the uh, resolution on your screen when, when you do that. OK, so those are there's your, your crash course in like what's roughly going on inside of your, your two-dimensional uh, displays as communicated by assorted radio announcers with low voices. Um, I think, of course, it's interesting to think a little bit about 3D displays, and, and also at the same time to think about why they don't really exist around us all that much. I mean, like just looking out in front of me, I can count like at least like double digits worth of two-dimensional displays, both laptop screens, the clock in the back of the room, the projector, this thing. Um, you know, somehow I think if we all thought about where we would be in 2021, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you might think of like interacting with some live 3D character, and, and that really didn't happen. Um, in some sense, maybe it's just because 2D stuff suffices, it's cheaper to make and, and whatever. Um, and also, we'll see that the 3D technology is, is really hard to get right. I mean, there's just a lot of different considerations that all have to work together to really make a 3D display not like, give you a giant headache, um, which is typically what happens to me. Uh, in fact, I had a, <laughs> when I was interviewing for professor jobs, I interviewed at a school that had one of those like, really fancy immersive things. And I, apparently, I'm one of the people that's more sensitive to like, you know, when, when these things are slightly wrong. And this professor was like really proud of it and like brought me in and wanted to show it off and had all these things going around. I got so sick and I was like in a suit trying to interview for a professor job. It was horrible. But anyway, um, when, when you talk about 3D displays, suddenly 
we have to understand both how you perceive 3D information um, and, and, and really how it gets communicated into your eye. And the main issue seems to be that like, there are so many different cues for depth. Right? Some of them are monocular, some of them are biocular, some of them have to do with brightness, some of them have to do with the content of the scenes. And oftentimes what happens with these displays is that those depth signals don't quite agree with each other. And then what happens is you get a giant headache. Um, and, and so this is sort of this well-known uh, kind of headache that, that really plagues a lot of the, the 3D displays around us, both in the kind of virtual reality sense where like 3D display is more like two 2D displays right in front of your face, um, to the more kind of passive stuff, right? Like a 3D screen that I could maybe walk around and see different angles, which is something you really just don't see, right? I mean, like the technology exists. We can do these kinds of things, but, but you just don't, don't interact with it much. So of course, this uh, you know, idea of binocular vision, this goes back a long time, apparently all the way back to like the early 19th century. Um, and you know, the reality is that you have two eyes for a reason, and that you know, the disparity between the locations of your eye, your focus, the divergence, and, and all these things are what's, what's playing together to, to create this uh, 3D effect that you perceive. So there are all kinds of different technologies out there for making 3D displays. Probably the main place that you interact with them is, is well, Pre-COVID was the movie theater, if you ever went to a 3D film, um, where you, know, you put on whatever glasses and then suddenly the thing in front of you is 3D. Of course, that's sort of this idea of doing stereo vision on a flat display, right? It's not like it's creating a 3D signal. It's still just getting reflected off a projector screen. Um, there are many ways to, to do that, right? So they, they fall into two different categories. There's active and, and uh, uh, passive here. So in the active one, I don't know if you've ever played with these glasses in the movie theater. They're really easy to fool, right? Um, essentially, they like have little shutters in front of your eye, in effect, that kind of turn on and off, and then like every other image uh, is every other eye, uh, and you can create a 3D uh, scene out of that. Um, of course, as with many of these displays, there's like a ballet that has to happen to get this right, right? I mean, like if that starts to get off cycle, then then suddenly like you just have again a giant headache. Um, but there are other versions of these things that are passive, right? So maybe you have two different images that are polarized two different ways. Right, so like you take the vertically polarized light, put it in your left eye, horizontally polarized light, put it in the right eye, and as long as you're not falling asleep in class, then you get the right 3D signal. Um, and there are other ones as well. So we'll talk a bit about these anaglyph technologies, which mean that you don't have to wear any uh, you know, thing on your face at all. On the other hand, the, the resolution is, is not so good. So when you talk about these 3D displays, it's important to kind of remember all of the different sources of 3D information that's going into your eyes. Um, and there are many, right? So, so when we talk about uh, depth cues, of course, there's stereoscopic ones like binocular disparity, right? The fact that like your eyes have to change angle when you look at different things. Um, you know, there's vergence, you know, it has, has to do more with, with focus. Um, as well as a lot of pictorial cues, right? Things like, you know, one object occluding another, how, how big things are, right? Stuff that's close to you tends to be bigger, I'm told. Um, shadows is another big one, right? You know. Um, these two circles are the same, but just by moving this little like gray blob, I think you perceive these things to be quite different. Um, and, and so all of these things need to be consistent in order to get your scene right. And when you look at these displays, you immediately realize that that's just not possible, right? Like, so here's a virtual 3D scene. You've got this computer display. I mean, what's, uh, what's, what's going to go wrong? I mean, the display ends, right? And the scene doesn't, right? So, so what's going to happen? You're looking at this nice lily pad, and then psh, it's just chopped, and then you see a 2D screen. Um, and, and so this is quite problematic, because of course what you perceive is this like weird black line that just doesn't align with all this nice stereo signal. And your brain is trying to resolve this, and it's not something you see in nature. And so depending on how you're wired, you may perceive one uh, thing or the other. Uh, you know, beyond that, there's actually, you know, Daniel, if you could step out of the room for a minute, I really appreciate it. It. Um, there are a lot of different uh, uh, cues here that, that, that need to align, and it's not just a question of like getting depth right. It's actually a question of comfort for the viewer as well. So sometimes if you do like the cold-hearted calculation, like where your eyes should be focused in order to see a shape, that's fine, but then you're actually asking the viewer to like stress their eye in one direction or another. I mean, the reality is you know, think about like a 3D film being projected on the back of, you know, like you're sitting in the back of uh, your favorite movie theater, you're watching a 3D film, like where are the characters <laughs> is a question that's hard to answer. Are they like right in front of you? Are they behind the screen? Like, the, you know, the, there's no 
the 3D thing that makes sense. Uh, and so, so what can often happen is that like, when you engineer these 3D scenes, and moreover you have viewers that are sitting in the front of the theater and in the back, um, you can end up giving people a really big headache because like some people that are watching this stuff are almost cross-eyed trying to resolve the, the depth information. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of times in, in 3D films, what I'm told is that the depth really doesn't make any sense. Like if you were to like move the camera on what's implied by the depth that you're getting in these like binocular displays, like the characters would kind of look flat. What's that? There's like a Greek art style that does this. What is this called? It's not fresco. It's um, these like statues that kind of get smushed. But in, anyway, like essentially, the, the reason for that is that like you want to see some depth, but you don't want to like be cross-eyed when you're, you're watching one of these these movies. And apparently, your perceptual system is kind of okay with like kind of moving things a little farther away um, to avoid that. In any event, um, right? So those are mostly displays where you're giving people's eyes different signals, and then they're trying to accommodate for it. There are uh, displays that actually try to project different views into your eye in a passive way, like in other words, to kind of simulate the light field that you would get by interacting with a 3D object. Um, I think the most common one that you may have encountered uh, if for, for kids these days would be that, that old uh, Game Boy kind of Nintendo scenario, right? Um, it's like the only 3D display, I think, that, that actually penetrated the market for a little while. Um, these ones are, are clever and, and actually, <laughs> You know, unlike your DLP projector, are, are like built in a really brain dead fashion, right? Like essentially, um, there there are two different kind of common technologies here: either using this lenticular display, like the left hand side, or using parallax displays. It's very easy to tell which one you have based on uh, just looking at the display. Um, so in a lenticular display, you have whatever your like favorite LCD screen is behind it, and then you have this like lens pattern that looks like this, right? And any idea like what that that lens pattern is is doing? Right uh, eye sees uh, is basically or rather the light coming from specific pixels is deflected either in the direction of the right eye or the left eye depending on where it is in relation to the light. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So essentially, what it's doing is it's redirecting the light that's just coming straight out of the display toward one of your two eyes, and that's what's sort of simulating having slightly different images that are projected in the two directions. Um, these these can be kind of tricky to work with because like. That's bent, right? And so, like, as you move, you know, it kind of like there's like some false motion that you can perceive just because of the shape of the lens there, and more of you kind of have to be sitting in front of it at just the right angle for this this effect to work. Um, a different display, which uh, is sort of has some fewer of these these drawbacks in some sense because there's nothing curved going on, is this uh, parallax barrier, or what you do is you just kind of like displace a little bit off the screen and then have just literally like pieces of dark material. If you think about it, it's just really, I mean, I think this picture actually communicates pretty well what's going on. Essentially, it's taking the light, which used to come straight out and blocking it and kind of forcing it to go in one direction or the other. Um, so both of these, basically the whole point is just to redirect light toward one eye or the other. And so long as you know precisely where the display is relative to the viewer, you can do this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, right? Like, you're absolutely right. Yes, you, you need to do your calculation really carefully, right? Like, in particular, if I took this black layer here and I just, like, moved it closer to the display, these rays would go in different directions, right? Um, so in order to make a display like this, you need to know how big is the display? Where is the viewer? How far apart are their eyes, <laughs> right? And, of course, that is a very difficult thing to hard code as a constant, which is effectively what you're doing because this is just, like, a piece of stuff sitting in front of your screen. What was that? Uh, uh, yes. Um, so the uh, right. So yeah. So I think the slider is basically just placing this uh, device in and out. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly right. So what can we say about the uh, the the resolution of these displays? Half at best, right? Yeah, you've got this giant pieces of black material that are like blocking half the stuff that comes out of your screen. Um, so the resolution does not tend to be so great, and I think that's one of the big reasons why people don't uh, uh, use it. But it has come into the market every once in a while. So like the Nintendo 3DS, I think a lot of people had, and, and that was, I think the 3D aspect of that was kind of a gimmick, but, but people did like it. And at one point there was even, before camera phones, there was that op this Optimus 3D LG phone. I'm guessing none of you guys had it, I'm, I'm old. Yeah, this was like a pre-iPhone kind of thing. 
And the big marketing technique was that you could go take, you know, 3D photos. And then if you view it on your, your lenticular display, you could, uh, you know, share 3D photos with your friends. But the resolution was really horrible. No, no, I don't think anybody ever used it. OK. Um, of course, this idea of, of redirecting towards your two eyes, like as, as Maria has pointed out, is, is not awesome. I mean, like essentially, it really needs a lot of, of knowledge of the viewer in order to, to engineer it right. Um, you can do better than that, right? Like you could take that lenticular display and get a better idea of the geometry of the lens or even kind of shape the lens to have more facets to it. And then maybe you can project light in all kinds of different directions. Um, there's a phrase that you hear a lot in the computer graphics literature called light fields. Has, has anybody ever heard this phrase before? So like you can think of the light field as like, if I'm just sitting at a point in space and I look in any given direction, it's like sort of the amount of light that is at this point going that way from any source. Right? And so like an ideal display and somehow is like trying to produce a light field that is similar to the 3D universe light field. But the problem is, of course, your source of your light and, and your colors are, are like restricted to a plane. And so all these different technologies are just trying to like redirect those light way, uh, rays in a way that, that better approximates it. Right? Um, so there are uh, some of these like N view uh, audio, auto stereoscopic displays where like it's trying to create these light fields by like looking along all of these different rays, computing the right color that should go out, and then like very carefully aligning that lenticular display to um, the thing that's behind it in order to create a 3D scene. Now, <laughs> what, what are some, some drawbacks here? Well, think about it. So like one column of pixels, <laughs> what, it, like, does it affect all of your viewers anymore? Kind of not really, like just people standing in a particular angle. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so there's, there's sort of two different headaches. One is that if you're, if you're doing virtual reality stuff, then yeah, you've got to render all these different views at once. You know, like shading triangles just got a lot harder than it was. Um, and, and moreover, uh, the resolution of these displays is really not so great, right? Because now you have the same number of pixels, but they're being used for like just individual images being sent in different directions. Yeah, so um, right, so that's, that's what's going on in these kinds of displays. Um, there are a lot of other t uh, technologies out there that have been experimented with over the years. I actually had a job once uh, uh, trying to engineer one of these things, and it was a total failure, but I had a lot of fun. Um, so another one, which is sort of like, I think if I asked a lot of you guys to engineer a 3D display and you didn't know anything about this space, you'd probably come up with something like this, because to me, somehow it, it like makes sense. Um, oops. Uh, ah. So here's a different, a different way to do it. So like. I'm sorry, my laptop is like having a lot of trouble today. Ah, come on. There we go. Um, so in some sense with these lenticular displays, we're giving up spatial resolution for, for like, uh, you know, 3D kind of multiple views, right? A different thing you could do would be to give up temporal resolution instead, right? So like, in other words, your animations have to go more slowly. <laughs> but the, the resolution of any one image is perfectly fine. And so this is an example of a display that does that. So here, um, Oh, no, cannot play media. Well, that's too bad. You can probably guess what's going on from the image here. Uh, essentially, there's a, a mirror that's sitting on a turntable. <laughs> and what they're going to do is spin that mirror really, 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 really fast. <laughs> the mirror is pointed slightly upward. So what you can do is have a projector facing down. And essentially, as the mirror spins, you sync that thing up with your projector, and you can display images in every possible direction. right? So as long as everything is synchronized together and that mirror is moving fast enough, you can indeed produce a 3D display. Um, the advantage here, of course, is that you can walk around it and, and it simulates the light field in any direction. There will be some downsides. How fast do you have to spin it? Yeah, how fast do you have to spin it, right? Because that's direct, like, can I have an animation that goes faster than, you know, the number of times per second this thing takes a loop? No, I mean, this, you know, like we talked about Nyquist rate like a couple weeks ago. The Nyquist rate is like looking at you in this, this particular device, right? Um, can anybody think of any other drawbacks here? Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Can, <laughs> would, could you put this thing in your, your, your kid's museum? Probably not, <laughs> right? This is like spinning around at some ridiculous rate. So I think typically they, they have these things inside of some case and, and, and for, good, uh, for good reason. Um, but actually, a couple years ago at, at SIGGRAPH, the computer graphics conference, they had, from my perspective, one of the most dangerous 3D displays I've ever seen, where they had these two beams that, like, I don't know what material, like, like what gas was sitting in there and what was coming out of these beams exactly, but when they met up, they would create a little spark. 
and they managed to like sync these things to make a 3D display by just like little explosions happening in the air. <laughs> And it was like the noisiest thing I've ever seen. And there, you know, there's this huge sign saying like, you can stand over here and there's the display over there and do not get any closer. Uh, oh, look, okay, good. So I do have an example of, of one of these things. So sometimes this is called a swept volume display. Here's an example. Um, and sometimes, I mean, they're very cool. Like it's kind of a shame we don't see more of these things. You know, like they take up a lot of space. They're, they're kind of dangerous and annoying and the resolution's not so great. On the other hand, they're super cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, I think this particular image is supposed to be like a molecular shape with the structure embedded in the interior. I'm sure for the purposes of this display, it was just somebody showing up. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the challenges here is that you have moving parts, you need the refresh rate and your rendering tool to be really, really fast in order for this thing to work. Um, there are all kinds of volumetric displays that have been experimented with over the years. I mean, if this is on one extreme of like being able to reproduce pretty much any light field, at least that's sort of restricted to um, some particular, you know, region, like you, you, you want to have like some, I feel like this is Skype calls people always envision are going to look like this someday. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but, but you never know. Um, on some other extreme are sort of the more brain dead version of 3D display where I'm just going to take my 3D scene, chop it into slices and just have like basically a bunch of computer monitors stacked on top of each other. Um, this can work as well. These are sometimes called static volume uh, displays. Um, but of course, the issue here is that if you literally stacked a bunch of computer monitors in front of each other, they would occlude each other. Um, so really what you need is a particular kind of screen that you can see through. Those tend to be expensive. And moreover, of course, you can't really have occlusion at that point um, because like, if you have something behind, it's just going to overpower what's in front of it. Um, so these things really didn't ever catch on. I don't, you know, th this depth cube company obviously was targeting medical imaging. Uh, industry, I don't think it ever really had a whole lot of market penetration. So anyway, it is kind of, that's all we'll, we'll say about 3D displays. It is just worth noting, like, this is a technology. We can do this. It's just not a thing that ever entered the, the market in any serious fashion. Who knows, maybe five, ten years from now we'll have to revise this. But um, at least for now, it, people seem to be happy with their, their 2D stuff. Um, by the way, if two, uh, 3D displays are a headache, um, 3D interaction is even harder. I mean, all of these displays, uh, essentially, you know, like the spinning one is obvious, but any of these displays, you can't like reach in and grab something. And so, you know, it's a lot of the advantages that you might think of for 3D come, I think, from more from the interaction than just from the visual aspect. And that's still like your computer mouse, right? So like when you put those two things together, suddenly the, the advantage becomes a lot smaller, right? So there have been assorted efforts to like make 3D mice and things, but those two also have to work together before you have anything that's, that's usable. And the applications are pretty limited. I mean, a lot of stuff you do on your computer screen is flat. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll see. Right, so, so that's that. And then finally, we can talk about VR devices, uh, virtual reality, which are, in some sense, like you could argue that are some kind of 3D display. It's not like the 3D displays are creating a perfect light field. Um, these things are, the difference, I think, when we use the term VR, uh, is that you have like a tattooed guy with uh, the display right in front of his face, right? This is different from like, you know, or it's sitting at some, some distance and, and you can view it or maybe multiple people can see it at times. Right, and so, you know, Oculus, Microsoft, many other companies now are proposing different devices and, and they do have some penetration. I mean, you can buy these things and, and um, you know, some gaming communities and, and apparently the future of Facebook all exist in this, this interesting virtual community and, and we're seeing a lot of investments in this space right now and we'll see what comes of it. VR is one of these interesting universes, historically speaking, because the technology has kind of grown in little fits and starts. And, and, you know, in each sort of time VR comes back, it gets a little better, but then there's some other, like Achilles heel that you need to solve next. And it's kind of interesting to go back and, 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 and understand all of that. I mean, like, <laughs> arguably the earliest uh, virtual reality predates computers by about, a, you know, a century. Um, you know, thanks to like Wheatstone and company, you could have these, these fun camera displays where you essentially would, I think some, this is like a kid's toy that does this, you know, with a little clicker on the side where you're getting stereoscopic uh, imagery by just, you know, putting filters in front of your eyes. Um, looks simple to you now, but then I'm sure it was like mind blowing, you know, it was like a 3D photo, like what the heck. Um, if you jump back, uh, jump forward rather, um, over 100 years, you uh, have one of the earliest VR, AR uh, devices by Ivan uh, Sutherland. Um, to me, this thing looks terrifying, but I think that that's more of a... Uh, it does. I, I don't know what it is about this photo that really, I mean, if you see it in person, it's not that, that bad. Um, does anybody know what this thing's called? 
Clockwork Orange, not quite. No, that was the same, same church, different pew. Um, I hope not. Um, no, this is the, the, the Sword of Damocles. Do uh, you have any idea where it was invented? MIT. MIT, that's right, right here. Um, so the earliest VR, AR uh, devices happened on this, this campus here. Um, and remarkably early, incidentally. I mean, this is 1968. I mean, we, we, we neglect that. <laughs> um, and then, of course, these days, there's this big explosion of these different technologies. Everyone, you know, a different one comes out every year. Um, of course, within that, there are like head-mounted displays are, are the ones I think we think of in virtual reality. Those also have early uh, history uh, back, you know, all the way back to 1916, I think, is the earliest recorded head-mounted uh, display, or HMD. I, always, I love this, like, this old patent. You should, go, you should look at it. Um, my favorite aspect is the little like, point on the top. It's called a pickle. Well, I have no idea what the pickle has to do with a 3D display, but apparently it's, 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 it's important. Yeah. Um, what was that? Yeah, that's good. I mean, you can like march on uh, your enemies, and, and you can also <laughs> have a 3D display at the same time. Um, but you know, these days, of course, many of the, the virtual reality devices are, are head-mounted. And really, like every year, a different one comes out. There's like, this slide is outdated. And, and <laughs> what was that? I mean, like I probably like snuck a few just like those like dentist glasses in there, and you wouldn't even know. It's like a military, um, they're called like virginity glasses. I'm not going to repeat that. So the uh, like, if you look at the assorted uh, technologies that that enable this kind of thing, there are really a lot of different pieces. I mean, what what Sutherland was interested in was just like the basic aspects of a digital display and what it means to sort of focus one eye or the other. You know, moving forward, of course, people started studying human computer interaction, haptics, all these different interactive techniques, um, but really the main headache that we're, we're continuing to overcome today is latency, right? That like you are putting a display right in front of someone's eye, and moreover, it has to react to their head motion, and if you do that in a slow fashion, you can really cause a problem. But even like looking at the old ones, this one looks a little less scary. Um, it's just another uh, angle on the same thing. Um, this was, by the way, back in the day when they just had computer conference. This was a very different time. Um, this is already like a remarkably impressive augmented reality display. It had two little two-inch uh, CRTs. There was rendering. He actually had head tracking. You can see it. <laughs> Different kind of head tracking than what we do today. Um, and you know, a little bit of interaction and, and, and so on. Um, it's really incredible to, to look back. I encourage you guys to read a little bit about um, Ivan Sutherland's work. I mean, he, he received like all kinds of awards and he should have because he's like decades before his time. Um, but really, if you look at you know like the uh, whatever Oculus display these days, it's it's basically the same technology. It's, it's it really hasn't changed a whole lot in some sense. You know, you still got two displays for the two eyes. There's still some basic head tracking. In this case, it's probably not like literally a mechanical device attached to your head into the wall, but rather some kind of inertial uh, measurement system. And they're really doing the same thing. So when you compare these different technologies, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Right? There's uh, Latency is the obvious one. Um, another uh, thing that people talk a lot about is field of view, right, which is essentially like you have this little display and then there's a bunch of black. Right? And so some of the early VR devices, for example, were really small little displays, which is needed because the bigger they are, the more pixels you have to work with and the more stuff you've got to update. Right? Um, there have been some creative efforts in this sort of space to do things that don't fit into this basic mall. Um, the one that everybody talks about, of course, is Google Glass. Um, this was not something that caught on, although apparently they still market it just like in specific communities, right? Like they're trying to get doctors to use it for a while. Google Glass is an interesting one only because they weren't trying to take over your entire field of view. They just wanted to augment it a little bit. Anybody know the, the sort of basic technology, like how this display works? It's a little bit different from the, the VR one. It's actually really clever. I mean, in a sense, it's a shame that a bunch of really obnoxious people wore it around and tried to advertise this thing and totally killed it in the process. Um, so essentially what's, what's going on in the Google Glass is that they're, they're using this sort of optical principle where like if I shine a really, really bright light on something that's otherwise transparent, it can start to become reflective. Right? And so you can, you can build this little display on the side of your eye, put this otherwise transparent piece of, of glass in front of your eye, and then if it's bright enough, you can get your email beamed like right into your face. Um, this particular uh, idea has a long history. It actually comes from theater. Uh, does anybody know the name of this? I always ask this, nobody ever answers. Um, right, so this is called the, the Pepper's Ghost Illusion. It's because like, you know, if I had a theater production and I wanted to have like a ghost in a scene, um, I could simulate it in this kind of funny way. So here I have like 
somebody is like off stage playing a ghost, or my niece would call it a goose, which I think is really cute. Um, and I want a ghost in my scene. So what I would do is I'd actually replicate my scene twice maybe. So once kind of like in the reflected thing, and then once you know behind the uh, piece of glass here. And then when the ghost appears, what we do is we shine a really bright light on them, and then suddenly this thing, you know, I'm using the law of reflection instead of just seeing through the glass, and the ghost appears on top of the scene, and it's very dramatic. Um, so here's a, a demo of what that looks like. Uh, instead of like 18th century schematic, uh, this guy did it with Legos, which I think is cute. Um, if it loads, I'm so sorry, this is slow. I promise we're almost done. Give it three more seconds. Otherwise, you guys can watch the YouTube video at home. Uh, I think it's cool. He has Pepper's ghost, and it's made of Legos. Ah, oh, there it is. OK. Um, right, so here's like a little DIY um, version of what this looks like. Maybe. Man, what is going on with the internet today? The one time we actually use it, I feel like we don't, there aren't too many clips in this class, usually. Hmm? It's got the preview. There you go. Yeah, you get the idea. So he's got this, uh, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, November whatever. He's got the face there. He's holding it in his mirror, you know, his window. Um, and if you do it just right, you can scare people, you know, just like that movie that I forget. Okay. Um, well, I'll let you watch that at home. All right. So of course, these days, um, that style of augmented reality, by the way, the phrase augmented reality usually refers to like some stuff is coming from the real world and other stuff is being produced by my display, um, AR, if you're in the know, um, also has a lot of other uh, settings. These days, a lot of AR is kind of interesting. <laughs> like you're essentially using your phone or your iPad as like a window. <laughs> right? I mean, if you think about it, it's like the world's most complicated piece of transparent material. Like you have a camera. It reads in the scene and then produces the scene again on your display. But in the process of doing that, um, of course, you can augment it in different ways. So starting with this Google Project Tango, and these days, now that our phones all have multiple cameras inside of them, we can do stuff like you know preview what a piece of furniture will look like in your house from different angles and kind of use your camera as a display at the same time. Right? So this is the sort of usual way of thinking about augmented reality. So, these days, the technology has exploded. There's a whole decision tree worth of like, you know, all the different technologies out there. You can follow all the different decisions people make to engineer these things. Um, I don't think it's worth doing this in a huge amount of, 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 of detail, but it's so easy to compare these things on a lot of different axes. And I think it's unclear what, what priorities will, will, will arise as the things we really care about. So, you know, stay tuned. Um, great. So we've got all kinds of different plots in here. I don't think it really matters. But in any event, with that, um, essentially, I think the, the point here is we've now completely finished our computer graphics pipeline, all the way from digital description of a scene to uh, actual colors being beamed into your face. And um, essentially, uh, the takeaway from today's lecture is that, I mean, there's this huge variety of different ways to produce an image. And the great thing is, as computer scientists, we never have to be aware of any of them. You know, we, we've all uh, essentially converged on some standard formats, ways of communicating, and these displays are reliable enough. Um, that they're essentially interchangeable. Uh, but if you go and work in that industry, there's some really exciting and cool stuff to be done, especially in the VR, AR space. Um, and, and I'm excited to see what you guys do next. So anyway, with that, in our next class, we'll have, um, I won't be talking. It'll be our graduate students and, and, um, and Zoe and, and possibly some faculty, if I can drag them in.